How are you wonderful people doing? My name is Michael Royce, known as Third Gen Gamer, and welcome to the Third Gen Cast. So, this is a brand new podcast. I planned on doing this podcast for months now, I would have to say. It just never came to fruition. I got busy with school, got busy with all this other stuff. I was like, oh, I'm going to get a format made up, get a logo made up, all this other stuff. And then it just turns out I never did it. And I was just like, you know what? Maybe it might be worth a shot just starting the podcast and then we can work on getting some improvements done, like the, getting the format figured out, getting, you know, the the logo, thumbnails for videos, which by the way, this is going to be going up on YouTube as a premiere on Saturdays at roughly, I believe it'll be 1 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. And also it'll be releasing on every single music platform such as Spotify, Apple Music, various other ones. I, I guess I'm not sure how that works quite yet. I have to figure out how to submit that. But if you're a new listener, definitely go check out my YouTube channel, which is Third Gen Gamer. I do a lot of Pokemon content where it's Let's Plays, uh, walkthroughs of Pokemon, challenge videos, hard uh, Pokemon Nuzlocke. So if you don't know what Nuzlocke's are, definitely go check out the channel because yes, we have some very tough Nuzlocke's that we're doing and it's, it's really fun. And uh, yeah, so anyways, let's talk about the podcast. So it'll be a one day a week podcast. Like I said, Saturdays at 1 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. It will be basically the topic could be literally anything, <laughs> literally anything, but it'll mainly be Pokemon and it'll also be some other things I want to talk about, uh, whether it's finances or just any news in general that I feel like is interesting. I'm going to talk about it. So it's not like I'm going to restrict myself to one thing. I could talk about YouTube in one section, or I can just talk about Pokemon. Like I can have different, I'm going to have like different segments for stuff. And today we definitely have a, an interesting uh, set of topics here that at the end, I'm going to go pull up some questions from my discord server, which by the way, if you want to join the discord server for my YouTube channel, Definitely go check out one of my live streams. The link to join my server is down in the description in any of my live streams. So anyways, I guess where do we start? I guess we could start talking about Pokemon because I mean, that's what my channel is all about. So Pokemon, uh, well, we had a little bit of an announcement today. Well, actually, it's going to be uploaded to Saturday. I actually recorded this on Friday. Actually, was it today? I'm pretty sure. Was it yesterday or today? I'm not even sure, but we had a new trailer for Pokemon Snap. So if you guys are talking, don't know what I'm talking about. Oh my gosh, Pokemon Snap. Wasn't that a game from the Nintendo 64? Yes. And now they have a new Pokemon Snap. As it says in the title, they could have gone with a better name. But you know what? Whatever. Uh, uh, they could have just gone with the numeric scheme. That would have worked perfectly fine. But hey, they want to do new versus Pokemon Snap 2. Okay. The name doesn't matter as long as the game is good. And I'll just tell you right now, the trailer was amazing it was just like the official trailer they showed off this last summer just absolutely just looks beautiful i mean it just it just shows you how far along we've you know come from like just technology advancements as a whole the nintendo 64 at the time was i would say pretty powerful and i mean the game as of today i mean i would say most 3d graphics definitely seem to not age well it seems like older games with the 2d sprites if they just do a good job of 2d it just it it ages much better but yes pokemon snap i'd say the graphics were kind of eh, but it was it was the it was like the top of the line at the time pretty much and anyways this new one that's coming out from the nintendo switch just it just looks amazing it's like i for personally before even knowing this game came out or at least it was coming out i just said you know what i would just love the regular pokemon snap on switch even if it meant like it would just be a straight up port, I don't care. I was like, this would be great. Well, I guess they exceeded my expectations, which is really, really nice. And I've, I'm excited. So basically my idea for the Nintendo 64 snap was that, okay, you can use the controller if you want, but if, if you're in handheld mode, you can use the gyroscope and then that's how you could take pictures. I feel like that would have been really cool, but I don't know. They might do something similar with the Switch. They haven't really showed... Uh, any of the controls and how that stuff worked. It just showed just a bunch of Pokemon in like different places and it just looked really solid. Maybe they'll have something similar to that. That'd be really cool. They did give a release date, which I believe was April 30th, which is a lot sooner than I expected. I was thinking sometime in the, like in the summer or maybe late summer, early fall. But then yet again, that kind of goes along with uh, Pokemon when they do their pretty much yearly releases. So... Yeah, maybe that sounds about right. April 30th sounds about right. 
But uh, that actually is a good segue to the next topic, which is Pokemon Diamond and Pearl remakes. So there's a lot of juicy stuff going on right now. Okay. Okay. All right. Let's hear me out. Okay. So everyone's been talking about a Diamond and Pearl remake for who knows how long. It's just, yeah, everyone's just so into the fact like, hey, Diamond and Pearl remakes, give it to us, Game Freak. What are you doing? You know, this makes you money. And it's just like, yeah, I mean, that eventually they were going to do that. But I guess supposedly a lot of trademarks for Pokemon Diamond and Pearl got renewed, which is really interesting to say the least. Usually when they do that, that means that either a trailer is going to be coming out for the game and whether it's going to be like something major or just an announcement just in general. And it'd be like, hey, this is Diamond and Pearl remakes, whatever they're going to name them. I, I don't know. Shiny Diamond and glimmering pearl no they're not gonna do that but they just those are terrible names but let's just say that they did that they want to trademark the original name before the actual release and we're seeing that now which is actually really exciting i'm sure someone's found something else like maybe url got renewed or something i don't know so i guess we'll find out when that happens let's just say diamond and pearl remakes would be really cool uh i hope that they really expand on the underground for Diamond and Pearl. Like there's several things I'm looking forward to. Just the fact I just want to see the, you know, the uh, Sinnoh region just in 3D, even if it's, I mean, graphics for Sword and Shield were pretty good outside. I mean, the wild area was kind of questionable at best, but everything else looks really solid. I'd love to see Sinnoh in that kind of graphic, like that kind of style. And it's it's exciting. So hopefully, if that does happen, we uh, get that yeah, we get a trailer uh, soon that would show that we're going to get it. Of course, there's always something that's kind of nicer. If you wait longer, there might be uh, either a new generation of Switch where a Switch Pro, or they might come up with a new lineup of a Switch. I think it's kind of premature that they would do a new lineup for Switch, but you never know. Uh, there were rumors about that too, but let's just go back to Diamond and Pearl remakes real quick. I'll come back to that in a second. But yes, Underground. That was one feature I really never got to play around in a whole lot. I mean, I did, you know, mine and drill for fossils in the Underground, but I never really had someone to play with in the Underground because I know there are tons of cool things that you could do in the Underground. I never got to do them because I didn't have any friends that were nearby locally that I could play with that I could utilize that underground and play with them and do all these little mini games. I would, that would be an amazing opportunity to use the YCOM update the YCOM though, because the YCOM is definitely a glitchy piece of garbage. I feel like they include, I feel like they fixed it for the most part, but I feel like in most situations that I do a live like stream and then I'm doing a max raid battle stream, people are not able to find my max raids, but I want people to join. I don't know that hopefully they get that all fixed and figured out for Diamond and Pearl Remakes. Maybe there'll be a one big update for the YCOM and fix that, but that would be really cool if you can log in to your uh, Nintendo Online and then be able to invite your friends into the underground and then you could play a bunch of mini games and stuff. I feel like that would be really cool. I would love to utilize that. And the underground really gives Pokemon another way to do Dynamax. I feel like that'd be a, like if they used the underground, they could actually add like Dynamax raid dens because if it's the same generation of Pokemon, they're going to want to make sure that the main feature of Sword and Shield, which was Dynamax, is in Diamond and Pearl. I feel like they're going to put that in the underground with all the other mini games and stuff. So I think that'd be that'd be really sick. I, I definitely would approve of that. So anyways, let's go back to the Pokemon or Pokemon. We'll go to the Nintendo Switch Pro. I know there is some speculation about that. People have been saying this. there's going to be a Switch Pro for years and let's just say it never happened because it was like, OK, so the regular switch just came out, I believe, in 2017. OK, so we're kind of like in the mid year console cycle kind of deal. Typically in it's about the, the console life cycles, like seven or eight years, maybe even less than that. So, I mean, I'd say maybe around this time, maybe a switch pro might happen, but the last couple of years are like, oh yeah, no, Switch Pro is going to be coming out right away. They did bring out, what was it, the Switch Lite? Yeah, the Switch Lite. I, I was thinking Switch Mini for some reason. Switch Lite, which that kind of serves as another type of uh, console for the platform. Undockable. Uh, it's it's not a, you can't dock it because it doesn't have the, like 
it doesn't give you the dock and also doesn't have the connectability uh, within the actual console itself to display on the TV. But I'm really interested in the Switch Pro if it does come out, which people are speculating it's this year. It seems like they say it every in the last two years. They said, oh, it's coming out this year. Who knows? Maybe it was intended to come out last year, but then because of production and, you know, the virus, maybe it might push it into this year. And I, I don't know. But one thing I would like to say about that, though, is that if there is going to be a Switch Pro and it comes out in March, like I, I doubt that it would come out in March. They would have said something by now. But let's say it does come out in March. Maybe it was intended for holiday of 20 uh of 2020 it's kind of weird i'm just thinking 2019 but it's 2020 because we're at the beginning of 2021 so yeah that's it's, it's kind of weird you know i mean we just started a new year it doesn't seem like it but you know it is what it is so <laughs> anyways switch pro uh if it's not going to be a new generation switch like a next gen it's probably not going to be that much more powerful. I feel like maybe they'll make the thermals better than be able to overclock it, raise the clock speeds, or maybe include a new feature. Because I know that they use NVIDIA for their processing in the Switch. So they have a feature called DLSS, which I don't know the exact what, what the abbreviation is exactly, but essentially it upscales the resolution. So let's say you play a game at 720p this algorithm with the DLSS would be able to upscale the 720p to 1080p, 4K, whatever. I mean, typically, if it's a really low resolution, it tries to upscale it all the way up to like 4K. It's not going to be very clean. It's going to look a little messy still. But either way, it would be really cool. And also, there was rumors that the Switch Pro would have 4K capabilities. I'm not real optimistic about it unless it is the super, uh, the super sampling in the DLSS. So... Uh, yeah, if it, if it upscales to 4k with that algorithm or that feature per se, I don't know how to exactly describe it, then yes, it'll be a 4k switch because then it could do that. I don't think it could produce true 4k. If it can't, if a switch at this time cannot push out enough power for high demanding games for 1080p, which in a lot of cases, a lot of games are below 1080p on the switch, even when it's docked on, and connected to the TV. So I don't really expect it to be a major leap in performance because I'm sure they would want to have that gigantic leap for the next generation, which for sure they're probably going to be doing a switch. The switch sold way too well to not do it. I mean, I at least I feel like that would be the case. But now that also makes me question, let's say they do a switch pro, okay? And maybe what if they just did it as a console? I mean, it kind of gets rid of the idea of the switching aspect from TV to portable. But I know a lot of people are saying that, oh, the, the Switch is going to have a 1080p touchscreen OLED display, which is a pretty nice display. And it's going to be the thermals are going to be good. What if that is all wrong, but they still do a Switch Pro and it's only a console? Because if you think about it, the Switch is in between. The light is only portable, which how would they be able to make sure the console is more powerful for these new games that are coming out for the PlayStation 5, Xbox Series X? Uh, there's A portable can only go so far. You do not want to fall behind because if a console is not as powerful, which if you could take a look at the Wii U for a good example. I mean, okay, well, let's take a second here. Wii U was a terrible console. I'm sorry. It had good games. But it was a terrible console. I had my Wii U up in the closet, you know, whatever. I don't use it anymore. Ever since I got my Switch, I never touched the Wii U ever again. It was it was not a powerful console. I mean, it was somewhat powerful, but then it had like a weird architecture. So these developers had to make this game. It had to make the game work for the architecture. And then some of them were just like, okay, the Wii U is not even power enough anyway, like powerful enough. Let's just give up on the project. And a lot of projects for the Wii U actually just straight up got canceled. Now, I'm not saying that the Switch is necessarily hard to develop for, for the most part, because a lot of their, the architecture is not uh, archaic. It's just that it's a low powered system, so it can go so far. So that is how many games would just get canceled on the Switch, especially if the PS5 and the Xbox Series X, a lot of games are being developed for that. It, the Switch kind of had a hard time with PS4 games and Xbox One games other than getting drastically scaled down. So I'm just trying to think if, at least I'm guessing that 
if they want something that would be able to withstand, like be able to stay somewhat powerful enough for developers to be like, hey, I'm going to still make a, a release for the Switch. I mean, I guess either way, if there's a lot of sales, they might still do it anyways. But it'll make things easier for developers if they do a more powerful console. And the only way to really do that is either put their next gen hardware into a Switch Pro or they do a console and been uh, have an, an ability to have adequate cooling for the parts to be able to boost the clock speeds much, much higher. I don't know. Well, I mean, we'll see. I mean, it sounds like a terrible idea, but the Switch Lite can't dock and we already got a Switch. So a console would mean, well, I it, you're losing the functionality of portability, but the light is getting rid of the portability of being on in on the dock to play on the TV. So I'm just saying that theory could be possible. I mean, this might be something that you may be listening to this and be like, oh my gosh, this is actually a stupid idea. Why did you even bring that up? And I'm just like, well, you know, it is what it is. You know, I'm just, I'm just giving out some possible explanations because I don't feel like a Switch Pro will have that huge mid-generation leap. I feel like they're going to save that for a new gen Switch. So it's either... It's either that if they're going to do another portable, it's not going to be that much faster, maybe faster RAM or a faster process, like a CPU, a GPU, whatever, but it's not going to be drastically better as if it was a next gen switch. I mean, if there is a, a switch pro, I'm definitely going to get it no matter what anyways, because I want to make sure I have the best experience possible with uh, any switch game in just in general. And who knows, maybe they might announce that later on this year and be like, okay, holiday 2021, boom, there it is. Go buy it. And uh, yeah, no, I, I guess you never know. But yeah, I mean, there's a lot of games on the Nintendo Switch that actually scale based on performance. Like if you know the game Doom, uh, let's just say that Doom, it, it basically does a resolution scale based on the amount of power it has and like, or it needs in order to play the game somewhat well. I mean, it still plays pretty well for, you know, beyond a handheld, but still not like the most ideal performance. If they did have a Switch Pro bump up the clock speeds a little bit, it may raise the, uh, the resolution a little bit or it might raise the FPS, which is always a very nice thing. So either way, I feel like it'd be cool. I personally, OK, like I said, it, I'm leaning towards the fact if they do a Switch Pro, it is not going to be that much more powerful. I could be wrong on that, and I hope I'm wrong because I would love to have a more powerful Switch, especially in the same generation. And it would make you, uh, it make you really question like the next gen is if it's going to be that much greater, which it definitely could be. You never know. So yeah, Switch Pro. There's that. All right. So here's a little bit of uh, an interesting topic. Okay, this is still related to Pokemon. Uh, let's just say if anyone's been really into the Pokemon trading card game, okay, Pokemon trading card game, the, it's recently gotten pretty popular just because of, you know, the Logan Paul, uh, break video where people bought booster packs of a first edition base set booster box. And then he opened up a, he did a live stream opening up the packs. Anyways, it's it got it caught the whole world by storm. TCG got popular again. People started buying up the supply and now nobody can find Pokemon product really anywhere. It's just absolutely insane. And now from what I understand, I saw I can't remember the source, which I wish I had the source on me. But uh, there was talk that a lot of these card shops that actually get these Pokemon cards are not receiving the amount of shipments or at least not an adequate amount of shipments for a tons of like tons of Pokemon product. And that is including a bunch of Pokemon card sets such as Darkness Ablaze, Vivid Voltage, Champion's Path was always just bought up, but I don't know. I don't really care for that set anymore, to be honest with you. I opened up a lot of Champion's Path, as you can see in my background, but yeah, no, Champion's Path, it's not going to be made a whole lot anymore. The next thing you know, they have another limited edition set coming in called Shining Fates which that's going to be, uh, it's going to be amazing. It's like Hidden Fates, but Shining. No, they, they all have Shining cards, but like those two cards, like they have Shiny cards of some sort. And yeah, it seems like that's also being hard to find as far as it's not out yet, but people are trying to buy up pre-orders and those are just selling out like crazy. And I actually did get a little bit pre-ordered myself, 
for Shining Fates, but it wasn't a whole lot. I only could get so much. It was basically, there was an online shop that a friend of mine recommended. I went on the shop as soon as they said it would open up and I bought as much as I could, which was only like two collection boxes before everything sold out. Tried to get an elite trainer box. That was nothing or that was, an, that was unsuccessful. And then I got just a couple of collection boxes, which is better than nothing, but I don't know what's going to happen with Pokemon, uh, at least for the trading card game. You'd think at this point, they're going to ramp up production, which they definitely could. But if you think, if they knew things were going to be popular, they should have already done it thus far. I mean, to be fair, the Shining Fates, people don't know how much they're going to get. So it may be that the production is up. But considering that Vivid Voltage, Darkness Ablaze is not, I mean, I think Darkness Ablaze just got a new print run, but there is like no Vivid Voltage to be seen, or it's very minimal from what I can see and just when I'm looking up things, I constantly have to look at a Reddit to find just if anything's in stock. And I don't typically buy booster packs unless they're at MSRP, which means that's just the normal price. And I don't know. I don't think that's going to be the norm anymore. Like being able to buy things at MSRP because everyone's just going to buy up everything and then sell it for a higher price. Just because they can, Nintendo is not, or I don't know, is it Nintendo that makes it? Just Pokemon Company in general that makes the cards? I don't know. It used to be Wizards of the Coast back in the day, and then Pokemon kind of took over. But yeah, who knows what's actually going to happen with those, with Pokemon cards? I mean, like the, the, the actual packs, they're probably going to go, instead of $30 for a product, it's going to be 45 Just like, it's just, it's going to be obnoxious. It's going to be so hard as a collector to do that. And also, there's a lot of sets in general that are just running up high in price. I mean, Vivid Voltage, I saw some places bumped it all the way up to $180 a booster box, which normal price is technically $144 if you buy from the Pokemon company. But I remember a couple of years ago when I bought booster boxes back in the day, you know, it seems like, yeah, back in the day, a couple of years ago, booster boxes only went for $99, $99 which is just absolutely crazy. Who would have thought that at this point, it's it basically doubled in price and it's only because the supply is not meeting demand. And that's usually how that works. That, that works with everything. I mean, take a look at PS5s and Xbox Series X. You can't buy them anywhere because scalpers buy them up, but the demand is there. So they're just gonna be like, okay, you want it? Instead of $500, you're gonna have to pay me $1,000. It's just like, that market is just so, uh, it's just so scummy. I, I avoid it, like encouraging scalpers, which is always why I'm on the search to buy things at MSRP, but it's always really hard to find. I got lucky with some of the Champions Path Elite Trainer boxes I've gotten. Luckily with the Reddit I have, I believe it's just Pokemon like abbreviated TCG deals. So it'd be PKMN TCG deals. Uh, that's the Reddit page I look at. And there's a lot of people that post. It used to be just deals. And now it's just, hey, there's a product here that's normal price. Go get it. It's just like, wow, just crazy, absolutely crazy. The next thing you know what, you see that post five minutes later, it's all gone. So you have to be on that page at all times, and then you will be able to be able to buy that pro product. Maybe, maybe it's not guaranteed. I know that Best Buy has kind of stopped a little bit of the, uh, of the uh, scalping, I actually did buy one of my Champions Path Elite Trainer boxes. What they do now is that if they do restock, which I don't think they're going to restock anymore, to be honest with you, but if they do restock the Elite Trainer boxes, you'll have to hit add to cart and it's like, okay, you're kind of like on a wait list. So how it works is like in five minutes, if the box is still available, the, the button will turn yellow again. You can add to the cart, go to checkout and you would get it. A lot, uh, it's just... It's rather interesting that they did that did it that way because it actually worked for me and it, it worked great. I mean, actually, I think it did that for my Marty box too. I could be wrong on that, but for sure the Elite Trainer box, it, it worked like that. So I was like, wow, that's amazing. It worked out. I got the box. But honestly, that's probably still not the best way to get things done. I mean, it's better than nothing. I mean, you could, if you really think about it, there's a lot of retailers that don't really do anything for scalping. I mean, that's just the, that's a huge issue right now. And I think they just don't care. It's like, okay, they make a sale. All right, all right, well, we got our money, so there's that. I mean, yeah, they don't have their limits. I mean, some places do, but even then it's like, okay, if you have tons of bots and you have a store limit of two, then you just have the bots buy two, go through checkout, and boom, you got still a ridiculous amount of product, and that's through a bunch of accounts. So, yeah, hopefully, 
hopefully production, no matter what sector of the market it is, that we actually we can actually lower the scalping. I mean, I I highly encourage people do not buy at scalped prices. All you're doing is just encouraging scalping for people to keep doing it over and over and over again. And if it's not profitable for them, they're going to stop. Simple as that. So definitely you if you're absolutely absolutely need something then I I guess okay, but just know that you're not going to be getting a good deal, that's for sure. But if you could just if you can wait for any just just wait for any restock and just keep an eye on stuff. It's it's just better that way because then you're not supporting that. You'll eventually get it no, normal price. And yeah, no, there's there's a lot of different things that are just hard to buy. Pokemon cards. We got, we got a wide selection of stuff. Pokemon cards, PC parts, which specifically graphics cards that I'm actually going to be talking about in the next topic. Game consoles. And I mean, honestly, it, it, there's just, there's just, it just sucks that this has to be the way it is, but I know production at the beginning of the year, or not beginning of the year, beginning of last year. That's kind of weird. I'm still in this transition phase between 20, 2020 and 2021, but we're still, I feel like production still, because everything got halted from like March to probably May, June, something like that. I guess it, it was different at different places, but just because of that, it affected tons of stuff. And I feel like to some extent, you can't blame companies like NVIDIA for their graphics cards, AMD for their graphics cards, uh, Pokemon Company for their Pokemon cards, Sony, Microsoft for their consoles. They had to stop production for multiple months. I mean, like, what could they do about that? All they all they can do is just hope that the supply can just, uh, just show up over time and, like, they can just get things made up, sell it as they can. And it's just, it's just an unfortunate situation. It really is. But... There's really nothing we can do about that. There really isn't. Just have to wait until supply can meet demand again, I guess. Or if you get lucky. Okay. So now it's time to go a little bit off of Nintendo, Pokemon. There's one topic I actually, one of my friends who sent me a question, or at least a topic idea, it was actually Bitcoin. So I, the reason why I talk about graphics cards, like, oh yeah, I'll talk about it soon. This is what it is. So... Graphics cards are being bought up like crazy. People can't build PCs. I know friends that cannot get their PCs built because they can't get graphics cards for a reasonable pr a reasonable price. A graphics card that was normally like 150 bucks goes for 400 bucks, and it's just like it, it's just a crazy market. And it's all because a bunch of people are buying them up to mine Bitcoin. If you don't know what Bitcoin is, it is a cryptocurrency. Uh, it's kind of like a it's decentralized, which means that there's no country backing the currency. It's just in general, it's a world currency. And I guess I don't, I'm not like an expert with Bitcoin. So I'm, some people might have a better definition than me. But essentially, there's people that have to mine it, which is just there's just big computer math problems. And then these graphics cards are being used to solve said math problems. And in return, if they solve the math problems, they get Bitcoin. And anyways, it just, it's been around since I think in the, what was it, late? So it was like the first decade of the 2000s. I think it was like late. So maybe like 2007, 2008, something like that. I don't know the exact year. But the whole premise behind Bitcoin was that a lot of people realize that a lot of governments around the world are printing money and and uh, that can lead to inflation, which means well, if you don't know what inflation is, basically the dollar becomes less powerful or whatever currency it is. And so that's why Bitcoin was made because Bitcoin has a certain limit and it can never be past a certain number. I don't know what the cap is, but I know that we actually are somewhat reaching the cap. There's still a little bit of wiggle room in there until we actually get to the cap, but you cannot print any more Bitcoin or you can't mine any more Bitcoin when the supply is completely bought up. And let's just say currencies, they can, it seems like, oh, they have a limited supply. Uh, it's, that's great. Yeah, that means there's no inflation. Wrong. They can, uh, governments, governments can print more money. Let's say if they have a, if they're doing like deficit spending and they're like, oh, we'll just print more money. And then that way we can cover our deficit spending and then, you know, give it out to where it needs to go, which more money means it weakens the dollar. In fact, I'm just going to say the U.S., there, because of coronavirus, we had a ton more spending in 2020, 
and it leads to the government, you know, by, like printing tons and tons more money. And it really, it kind of, it kind of started uh, like when Bitcoin started up. Like that, it wasn't just in 2020 that we started printing money, but it definitely we printed a lot of money as the money supply actually has been going up. There's like charts. I don't. I think it was like the M1 money supply chart. I'm pretty sure it was that it showed that, okay, there's like a gradual growth. It was still going up pretty fast from like 08 to like up to 2020. The next thing you know, at coronavirus stimulus packages, uh, just other spending in general, investing into, you know, the vaccine. Next thing you know what, the money supply goes from this to this, like that's straight up, but you know what I mean? It's kind of like more of an angle and it's just Bitcoin is kind of like people are buying it as an asset, which a lot of people are buying it for currency, but it's kind of like people are saying that it's like gold. So like, for example, gold's very valuable. If let's say the market just goes to tank, gold just goes up. That's the same way. That's the theoretical uh, thing about like, that's what Bitcoin is. Essentially, that's what people are using that or like treating it as kind of kind of like gold. So if let's say the market just completely tanks and next thing you know, let's say this inflation definitely does make an impact on our US dollar, then the Bitcoin's just going to soar because the Bitcoin is not related to the US dollar. So naturally, Bitcoin is just going to go up. And yeah, that 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 prevents you from losing uh, not necessarily money per se, but it keeps your wealth strong per se. And yeah, no, I, I never really got into Bitcoin until rather recently as, you know, everything started spiking like everyone else has. My brother actually bought some it was way back in, I don't know, maybe 2013, 2014, maybe. I'm not 100% sure exactly uh, when he bought it, but essentially it was like when Bitcoin was like, I don't know, it was like $1,000 a coin and it was kind of fluctuating. I think he might have bought it on the dip or something. So he got, it was like $700 a coin at the time. He ended up buying half a coin. And then of course, in 2017, there was a major spike in Bitcoin where it went from, I mean, a thousand dollars all the way up to nineteen thousand, and he actually did sell around there and actually made a good profit. But little did he know. I mean, of course, it went right down. It crashed hard, Bitcoin, and it, it dropped down to three thousand dollars. Okay, three thousand dollars, and then it kind of steadily grew. And then next thing you know, it COVID drops. <laughs> and then now it's building up, and then because of all the spending and all that other stuff. People are worried about inflation, the dollar getting weaker. People started buying it up and I'm, a lot of other places are too. It's not just the US, it's a global thing. People can buy it wherever. I guess some places it might be legal or illegal. Some places, I don't know, if, like there may be some places that actually ban Bitcoin. I don't know exactly, but yeah, Bitcoin, it's at a crazy amount. Like I think it was in September, it was roughly about 15 to 20,000. And as of last week, it broke $40,000. Yeah, $40,000. I actually invested into some Bitcoin at about 30,000. Actually, it was 27, then I bought a little more. And then I ended up going to like an average cost of 30,000. It went all the way up to 40,000. And then there was a big decline, or at least it wasn't like a huge decline, but it went all the way down, uh, back down to 30, but I actually sold at 35. And then I was like, oh my goodness, uh, this is going to be the slide like just like it was in 2017. Turns out it didn't necessarily happen or at least didn't happen yet. And now it's actually climbing back up again. I think it's currently at about 37,000. I was actually keeping an eye on Bitcoin the last couple of days to buy back in because there was a uh, speculation that uh, the market was going to go bear, which means that bear and bull, like if you don't know, um, if you don't know stock market stuff, uh, bear and bull market. Bull means that the, you're expecting the price to rise and you know grow, and then uh, bearish. Like if you're bearish, then it's, you're expecting it to go down. Anyways, there was a lot of bearish uh, look to Bitcoin. Anyways, today it actually hit like a certain challenge level, and it was leveling off at about thirty six thousand, and then now it just went like it took off again. So I mean, it didn't really take off per se. Like there's still some resistance keeping it from going up. But I was like, I was hoping it was drop because it was normally at about 36. I was hoping because a lot of analysts, a lot of Bitcoin people, I was listening to a lot of different people talk about this. They were hoping that it would go to 36 and then it would be fighting to get higher than 36 and then drop down. Uh, it, people were saying uh, around 32,000. So I was like, oh, that'd be nice. I'm going to buy in there. And so I waited and waited and waited. And then next thing you know it. 
tonight on Friday at eight. Well, it's eight p.m., but it was like around seven. It broke through, and now it's looking it's looking more bullish. So it's going up in price. So I actually did buy a little more Bitcoin. Gradu so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna gradually add Bitcoin over time. There's a strategy that's called uh, I believe it's just average cost. I think it's just average cost uh, basis. I think that's what it is. Average cost basis. Where basically you're not like trying to trade it. I mean, I tried to do it a little bit and it's just insane. Don't do it. I mean, I might, if there's like drastic swings happening, I might, okay, I might sell here, buy there. I don't know. We'll see. But uh, basically what I'm talking about is that basically you buy at different points, whether it keeps going up or if you buy some while it's going up and some when it's going down, essentially you're going to have uh, a, an average that's right in the middle. And then that way it keeps your investment relatively secure and it makes it easier to you know recover because Bitcoin is definitely going to be going up because there's, I mean, there's a lot of enthusiasm for Bitcoin right now. Institutions who were normally against it, which is basically large corporations, actually have been buying up Bitcoin and it's been going up. And yeah, it's, I don't know, I don't think a whole lot of institutions have got in yet. There were some, but at some point they will and they'll, People are considering it as an asset like gold now versus a theoretical currency, which it still is a theoretical currency, to be honest with you. But people are are treating it as if it was gold. So it is going up. So th there's some people that are saying it'll break 50,000 in the next week and then kind of level off, go down, whatever. And then there's some people that are saying, oh, by the end of the year, it'll be 100,000 or 200,000. You're like, oh, whatever which I don't know if it'll actually get up that high. I mean, I guess you never know, but if it does, holy cow, I'm glad I got some Bitcoin. <laughs> but yeah, it wouldn't hurt to have some cryptocurrency. It's There's another one called Ethereum, which is another solid one. It's kind of, it's a lot smaller than Bitcoin right now. It's at about a thousand, roughly, maybe 11, I think it's 1100 right now. But yeah, essentially, it's always good to have some, have some diversify, like if you have money, and you want to make sure you don't lose your money or lose power on your money. Obviously, you want to diversify your portfolio. Like, for example, you want stocks. You want, I mean, you want fiscal assets, whether you want to buy gold. I actually did buy a little bit of gold just in case. And I also bought a Pokemon booster box, Evolutions, which I bought for $450. And it's already going up to $750, according to eBay, which is just insane. And yeah, and then I bought some crypto. And then I'm going to be adding on to it over time. So it doesn't hurt to diversify. Of course, you don't want to do all Bitcoin. You don't want to do all stocks. You don't want to do all gold. You don't want to do all Pokemon Evolutions booster boxes. But yeah, it's just you want to make sure you diversify your portfolio. I'm uh, in college. Uh, I actually am a finance major. And it's always like I, I'm not necessarily I'm not too far in as far as like my upper finance classes. I'm actually getting into more of my finance classes now. I had a lot of gen ed stuff and I got, I, I got to the bare bones, scratch the surface of finance thus far. It's about to get more advanced, but I'll tell you right now, uh, if you're a young person, you have the ability to do so. Definitely, uh, definitely invest. I mean, I don't know, maybe the stock market is not the best best choice right now, to be honest with you. I mean, I guess if you're going to leave it in there for the long term, it doesn't matter because the market always corrects. But uh, like, for example, uh, when coronavirus shut down the whole US for the most part, the stock price for everything went down. I actually was up around eight or nine hundred dollars at the time. And like in my investments, like I had AMD and I had Home Depot and I had some other ones. I don't remember what it was because of coronavirus in March the market tanked and I actually was down $300. I didn't pull out. I left it in there because like, it's going to recover. And then I slowly bought other stocks while they were at a discount. And then they, I actually ended up growing my, uh, my portfolio, my stock uh, revenue, or I guess my gains have gone up a lot more than a typical year because I bought on that major dip, which it did correct. Of course, it may not correct that fast every single time. In fact, in most instances, it doesn't. But it just happened to work out that time. Then it worked out that I had some big returns for the year because of the fact that uh, I didn't sell anything. I still have, actually, I did sell some stuff so I can invest into crypto, but I did keep most of my stocks for the most part. And uh, I'm leaving them in there.
And if, if the market does crash within, I mean, the next couple months or so, which there's people saying that it will, like it's like the stock market's in a bubble right now. If it pops, it's going to drastically drop, which is definitely possible. There's a lot of overvalued stocks in the stock market like right now, like Tesla. I bought into Tesla and then I actually sold Tesla recently because I'm afraid that they're going to, th that the bubble's going to burst and whew, it's going to go down. But uh, let's just say that, Anyways, there is a, uh, it's always good to diversify your portfolio. I wanted to go into that a little bit just because, yeah, I I always want the best for everyone that's listening or watching uh, this podcast because obviously, I mean, money is, in a way, money is power. And I'd say in many instances, money is power. And I would say if you have the ability to invest now, uh, and not, and you have to make sure that you don't touch it, whatever it is you put it in, you don't touch it. I mean, unless like a company is like going under, it's like, okay, save. But in most instances, a company is not going to completely go under if there's going to be a, if the, if a bubble pops or if there's a recession, whatever it is, typically if you invest into big companies, you're okay. But it's just, you don't, it, you, you just want to make sure if you do invest, you just don't constantly be buying and selling because that's when you lose money. That's when you lose a lot of money. If you you gotta get rid of the fact you have emotions for your money, it is hard. Trust me, I, in my finance course, I actually did an investment course this last semester. Be like, I did a whole chapter on behavioral finance, and it definitely emotions can affect how you trade. And of course, when I invest myself, I definitely have that happen to me from time to time. Just the fact that oh my gosh, my stock is selling, gotta sell. The next thing you know, it the next day. It, it goes up and it recovers and you're just like, welp, that sucks. So yeah, there's a lot of good information out there for stocks. Of course, I would love to have like a, a finance-esque section in every single podcast. And I just want to make sure, you know, if people have the ability to do so, please do it. Even if it means like you have to cut some costs that are not necessarily necessary, like for example... Uh, if you have to cancel Spotify, I mean, you use it like, I don't know, maybe like two or three times a month. It's like, okay, do you really need it? Cause you could take that money and put it somewhere, invest it. And over time it will be worth something, especially if it's something that has a dividend or a company that has dividends in their stocks. Cause yeah, if you slowly keep adding money to a dividend stock, you get dividends. Those go back into your investment as kind of, it gets reinvested. And then next thing you know, it, uh, it does like this compounded interest effect that, uh, yeah, you get a 30 cent dividend on each share you have, but the next thing you know, you have enough shares that you actually get a full share just from the dividend itself, which and it depends on what type of stock you have. It's kind of tough for a major stock, but it's definitely possible if you have the money to do it. But yeah, compound interest or compound growth in general is a very, very good thing. And especially if you have money that you invest and you just don't touch it for a very, very long time, it will definitely it will definitely pay off in the end. Cause let's say you start investing at the age of 20. I actually invested at the age of like 19, roughly kind of, it was, I think it was like, I was about to turn 20. That was when I started investing into stocks. In fact, I actually, uh, I use the app Robinhood. Robinhood is a commission free app. Cause a lot of places or if you buy stock, you have to pay a commission for when they buy or when you buy and when you sell, which Robinhood doesn't do that. And it's, it's a nice idea. I mean, there's some other ways they make money. Like for example, they serve as a bank. I, I believe this is how it works. They serve as a bank and then you put your money in, you buy stocks, but they technically already own the stocks because they have their own portfolio. You basically just get their share. Your money stays in their, in their bank. They get interest off of all the money that's in there. That's how they make money. I feel like that's how they do it, but I could be completely wrong on that. But yeah, always a good idea to invest. Even if it's not much, even if it's just, I mean, a few dollars, like just like a few dollars a week or something, it is always good to do it. Simple as that. And as far as where to invest it, I would say right now to play it safe, I would still say stocks, but you could invest into Bitcoin. Even every little bit does matter, if you, especially if you keep putting money into crypto over time. And also it, there's and gold too. I mean, there's a lot of apps out there you can download and you can buy gold. Basically, you just, you use your debit card into this, uh, onto this app. You basically take your money off of it. And like, they just basically 
do a, like a payment or something. And then they put the money into your app and then you can invest into gold, silver, platinum, whatever. I believe the app I have is one gold. Uh, I actually could check that right now, actually. Yes, one gold is the one I have. And then also Robinhood is what I use to invest. Uh, even with crypto, I don't have a whole lot of crypto. Like I have Bitcoin, I have Ethereum, but uh, that's it. Like I would say if you're like, if you want to buy just the basic cryptos, Robinhood is a good way to go. I mean, if you want to have a crypto wallet, which I'm not going to get into because I don't even know much about crypto wallets because I don't have one, but that's an ability. Like you could do that theoretically speaking. And it's like, you can trade through that, which by the way, I wouldn't advise trading unless you know what you're doing with uh with cryptocurrency like you can buy and sell over time but just don't constantly be looking at bitcoin and watch it rise and fall i mean i was doing that the last couple days just to analyze the behavior of bitcoin and yeah a lot of people buy based on emotion with bitcoin it is pretty crazy so there's there's ways you could trade and make money with bitcoin there's tons of crypto youtubers out there that tell you what to do and they have all these different things like different options you can do like you can call or, you know, you can sell, like, what was it? You could short, you could short or long. I think that's the term for Bitcoin. But you could, there's always short call, long, uh, short call, long call, short put, long put. That is in just regular stocks. I don't, I don't know. Maybe they just have something different for crypto. I have no idea. But there are plenty of, like, diff, uh, there's ways to make money with Bitcoin. Just don't constantly buy and sell because that's when you have issues, which I actually did that at first. I was panicking when everything was going down and it was like, oh my gosh. So I actually lost a little bit of money just because of that. So don't do that. Just just put money in over time to get that cost-based average or, or cost average basis or whatever. I think that's the right term for it. Do it. So that way it averages out over time. And then, yeah, you still get to put money in. And then, yeah, it's just, yeah, just don't, just don't mess with it. Just put the money in, let it go. And honestly, just forget about it. Just throw the money in there and forget about it. Because, yeah, there's going to be times where it swings up and down. You're like, oh, my gosh, got to pull out. And in the end, in most cases, Bitcoin looks like it will keep on growing. So, I mean, I could be wrong, but it looks like it will keep on growing. And I guess if you want to make the trades, you could if you want to. So, with that being said, I mean, we're at about 47 minutes. I'm going to go and grab a few uh, questions that I got from my viewers, which by the way, uh, I will be opening up a, uh, like a email for third gen cast. And then that way, if there's anyone that's listening, uh, you could definitely submit questions to my email. That would be for the podcast. I'll just, uh, I'll just be able to, uh, I'll just, I'll, we'll just go with as of right now, if you want to post, if you want to make questions, or create questions, or have any topic you want me to talk about, uh, just go to my YouTube channel. Actually, I'll put it in the description of this video as well for the podcast. Just join the server, and then that way you can ask your questions that way. There's like a, under YouTube on the side, there's third gen cast questions, and that is uh, where that will go. And yeah, anyways, I'll just look at some questions here. So, uh, okay. So I actually have a question from a friend of mine named Bry, and he asks, what mo what motivated you to start doing content? Okay, so I started doing YouTube in 2011, 10 years ago, okay? I was actually on a different YouTube channel. I was on the Battle Productions, which is just another, it was another gaming channel. I was like 10 or 11 years old. I don't remember exactly. Maybe I was turning 11 at that year, I think, or maybe I was 11 turning 12. That actually makes sense because I was born in 99. Anyways, it was like May of 2011. That was when I uploaded my first Pokemon video. And it was heavily inspired by Marilyn, Chuck Conroy, Lou Roy, all these big YouTubers back then. Uh, that, I mean, most of them were Poketubers. Chuck Conrad was mostly, he was Nintendo, but he did some Pokemon. Anyways, those three people were essential in why I started YouTube in general. And yeah, to this day, I mean, of course I had periods of time where I did stuff and then I didn't do stuff, which that was on the battle productions. I had many years where I was uploading tons of content, didn't upload content, uploaded more content later. And it was just so inconsistent but I did accumulate about, I think it was 13,000 subscribers over time. And I think it's still growing a little bit, like just by just sitting there with all my videos on it, I guess. When a lot of people not knowing that I have this channel, Third Gen Gamer, which by the way, if you are listening to this, T-H-I-R-D, 
Gen Gamer, not abbreviated like 3RD. No, it's the actually the word. If you want to go check out my YouTube channel, put no spaces. It just have it all condensed into one word just because YouTube, for some reason, doesn't want to show my uh, my YouTube account with the spaces in it. So anyways, uh, th they started me to do they st like Chuck Conroy, Maryland, Lou Roy, all those guys made me start YouTube. Well, they didn't make me, but you know what I mean? Like they inspired me. And to this day, I mean, I've I've been uploading content since then. Of course, I'm on my new channel, restarted, started fresh. We're close to 6,000 subscribers on YouTube, which is just absolutely amazing. And that was, we're approaching our second year uh, in, what was that, in four more months, which is exciting. So yeah, six about 6,000 subscribers in two years is pretty solid. I'm hoping this year is the year where things just start going up exponentially. Maybe not. I don't know. We'll see. I got to get some momentum going again, whether it's a challenge video for Pokemon, top five videos, which I did upload a new one. And then also just hard nuzlocks. That's the big thing for this year for me. Hard nuzlocks, live streams, video content. It's just going to be, it's going to be a pretty productive year and it's really exciting. So if you like what you hear, definitely subscribe to the YouTube channel and hit that bell icon for notifications whenever I upload or live stream. It's just, it, it really does help out with the channel. And yeah, it also helps the YouTube algorithm because if I'm uh, if I'm gaining more viewers, more watch time, YouTube likes that, throws me into the search results and you know, it's all that stuff. But yeah, that was how I started doing content. I started with basically a really, really bad camera. Uh, it was like a really old Polaroid camera. I don't know. It's like a little red Polaroid camera. It had macro. And what I would do is record my Game Boy screen with the camera. And I played like Pokemon Sapphire, Crystal, I believe I did Heart Gold and Soul Silver. That way too, I like go into a closet in the dark. So that way I wouldn't have like weird reflections. And yeah, I was in the dark recording these videos and it was, it was an experience. But yeah, over the years, uh, I built, I got, I got like brand new computers. I started just building up, trying new uh, video editing software and then upgrading the equipment. And today we've gotten to the point where we have I just built a powerful computer for like this last March slash April ish. And I don't remember exactly when we got a new monitor, the Shure SM7B microphone, which I absolutely love an audio interface that let me, that lets me do amazing things like ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, it's the gen, third gen cast. Yeah. You know, so yeah, no, um, it's just like, it's, you don't really have to start with everything you need to make content. You just got to make do with what you have and just improve it over time, which is what I'm actually gonna be doing with this podcast because I don't really have much of a format right now. So that's why here today I am currently uh, just grabbing topics, talking about stuff. And then hopefully at some point we'll be able to develop a format, which also I forgot to mention earlier, If assuming everyone's still listening at this point, if you are mad props, I really do appreciate it. I appreciate the watch time and also on Spotify. I don't know how they measure that. If that helps with anything, I have no idea or any other like Apple, Apple music, Apple podcasts, whatever it is and other various music platforms. Uh, I'm not sure how that, that works in all those platforms, but for sure, YouTube watch time is King. Thank you so much for watching this, but I will be having guests for this podcast. It won't be very often. I'll have some friends of mine and also some fellow content creators just be able to have them on call with me to talk and then we'll be able to, you know, whatever topics are going on or what major news that's happening, we could have someone to discuss topics because we always love to hear more than one person uh, discussing something because that way we can kind of get different looks or different approaches to things. And maybe at some point I might have a guest every single live stream. I don't know. We'll have to see. But yeah. So naturally, that's just, Yeah. Anyways, I, I went from YouTube to that. Uh, I don't know. I got to get this format thing figured out, but it's all right. We'll, we'll get it. We'll get it. We'll get there. It'll be fine. We'll be good. So anyways, uh, I'll take one from my good old buddy, Graham. It's natural to compare yourself to other creators. Have you ever doubted yourself or felt like you weren't funny enough or just felt inadequate as a content creator, as a streamer compared to others you know? If you have, how do you overcome these doubts and insecurities that come with streaming and also video content? So I would say this is probably an ongoing challenge for me myself. I mean, I try my best to not be like that. Uh, you know, it's always hard. Like as a content creator, you have, you know, it's nice you want to be able to be so positive about 
how like like you're like oh this content's doing well it's like oh i'm doing my putting forth my best effort but there's plenty of times where it's just like oh this just didn't go well this didn't turn out well oh boy and then also it's like oh you're looking at other creators and you're like oh man I, i'm just not like them i just can't do this i can't do that but ultimately what this needs to like it, i have to improve on this too but what I need, to, like what you need to do in that situation is that you just need to have the desire to improve yourself. You can't be that one person that's always negative all the time. Like, oh, like, let's say somebody you're putting in effort to do something, but then somebody else is doing, putting less effort into it. And then they're doing so well. You can't let jealousy get in ahead of what you're trying to do with your content. Eventually, if you're working your butt off for your YouTube videos, live streams, whatever it is, it will pay off in the end. You just have to keep on being on the grind and constantly being improving. Because yeah, if you're if you're upset about how things are performing, like on your YouTube channel, you have to find ways to improve it. If you if you don't, then it's just gonna stay level. You you can't improve yourself if it's just gonna stay level. Like like if you're like if you're expectationally, oh, I'm not, uh, I'm just not doing so well. You just don't want to put the effort into it. Typically, that's when things start declining. You may be leveling off right now, but next thing you know, it there's going to be this sharp decline in your content, viewership, whatever it is. So you just got to be you got to be positive as much as you can. Though I like I said, I mean I struggle with that from time to time. But I feel like every single content creator in some way has this feeling, and whether it it could be to different extremes, but it does happen. And it's just that you just got to be you just got to. You just got to grind it out and just put forth your best effort and hope for the best and try, try new things. If something's not working for you, try, get a different approach, try something different. And maybe if you try something different, it might catch on and it, it just never want to just stick with the same thing over and over again. If it's just not working. So yeah, no, I mean. There were times where I felt like I wasn't funny enough. I mean, there's plenty of times where I'm just like, oh, I can watch this person. And I think they're hilarious. And I was like, oh, I, I, mean, I go to mine. I'm like, yeah, okay. I mean, I have some funny moments, but I don't maintain the humor, the the funny, the laugh, the laugh and the funny. Oh my goodness. I can't talk anymore. Man, this is a problem if I'm doing a podcast. But uh, yeah, no, it, there's times where it's like, okay, yeah, you definitely feel like that. But I would say in the end, just got to stay humble and just put forth your best effort. It's just simple as that. Simple as that. So let's see. I have another question here. Uh, what's your realistic expectations for this year being the 25th anniversary of Pokemon? Are they low, high, and how excited, disappointed you think you'll be and what with whatever they decide to do? I'm excited for the 25th anniversary. I mean, they haven't really revealed a whole lot, at least yet. I mean, they I mean the Shining Fates is a pretty big deal. There's rumors for Pokemon cards. There's gonna be another Pokemon Evolutions like set coming out next fall. I mean, if that happens, that'd be really cool. Sinnoh remakes, that'd be nice if it was this year too. New Pokemon Snap coming out. I mean, I, I'm happy with that. I was just happy if they just brought over Pokemon Snap to the Switch. But yeah, whole new game, that's just exciting stuff. So my expectations are pretty high, but yet again, if I, if they don't meet the expectations, it's not like I'm gonna be hating on the Pokemon company because they didn't, meet my expectations i mean it sounds like they have a lot of stuff coming for us for the 25th anniversary and if they don't then there's always a 30th a 30 i think 30th is a much bigger deal than 25 but 25 is still pretty good i'm just saying but yeah no i'd say my expectations are pretty high but i i mean yeah and once again if there's something that if it doesn't meet expectations like okay whatever you know i'm just gonna move on i'll just i'll be happy with what i got and we just move on simple as that i feel like so many people are super critical of pokemon and when they have these high expectations and then they don't meet them, next thing you know, they're constantly like ranting or just doing whatever. They're just posting like a bunch of hate and all this other stuff towards Pokemon. It's like, come on. I mean, th to some extent, it's like, okay, yeah, if they're skimping out on stuff, yeah, call them out for that. But don't be constantly hating on them for that. It's just, it's not healthy. It's not good for you. I mean, constantly being upset all the time. It's not a good thing. And just, yeah, they're a company. They... I mean, they're trying to, they're trying to meet our expectations, but sometimes they miss. It's just how that, that's just how it works sometimes. But yeah, no, I'm excited for the 25th anniversary. Whatever comes out, comes out. And yeah, once again, like, let's say, let's say the Sinnoh remakes don't happen. It's like, okay, no big deal. I'll, I'll wait another year. If it means that a game is in working condition and it doesn't have any issues, it's fun. 
push off the game longer. Even if it, it even if it would make some people upset, I'd rather have a high quality game than a rush game. So we are at that one hour mark. Holy cow. I felt like with the amount of topics that I had, I felt like I wasn't going to make it to an hour. I mean, okay, we're approaching the hour, but yeah, no, it, it turned out pretty well. I mean, I'll Every week on Saturday, I'm hoping to get a, a third gen cast podcast episode out for all of you to watch or listen to. And yeah, I, I think this was a good first episode. I feel like there's going to be a lot of things I'll be able to improve from this first podcast. But hey, this is the start. We're going to make sure that this is one of the best podcasts on the entire Internet. I don't know. Everyone will be excited. This is going to be this is going to be a journey and trying to stay consistent with it. It's going to be tough, but. We'll see. It's going to be fun. It, I feel like I I felt like I I've, I've been doing like Pokemon shiny hunting on my YouTube channel and live streams and it's basically it was a podcast. It was just that me going around in circles hatching Pokemon eggs and that and it was just me just reading comments in the chat that were different topics. So it's just yeah, I mean this was essentially the same thing. I just happened to grab a few ideas and just expanded upon them. I felt like as a whole, like if I were to improve from this episode, I would say that the beginning was a little bit scrambly in my opinion, but towards the end, I feel like we stayed on the, on like one topic and then we just carried through it and then we just got through it. So maybe it was just because, you know, we just started, we, that we're going to have that, but I don't know. I feel like we had a very good first podcast. Hope you guys enjoyed. If you're on YouTube, definitely hit that like button. Hit that subscribe button if you're new, especially if you're listening to me on any of the various podcast platforms over on YouTube, Third Gen Gamers. Third is in a full word and then no spaces for Third Gen Gamer. And yeah, thank you so much for watching, everyone. And yeah, I'll see you guys next Saturday. See you all later.